So our next uh, speaker is Melissa Furlong. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Community, Environment and Policy in Melanie Zuckerman College of Public Health. Thanks, Frank. Um, today, can I, let me see if I can make this bigger. Okay, today I'm gonna to be talking about big data approaches to evaluate pesticide toxicities in humans. Okay, so we've mentioned pesticides a few times today. Um, so pesticides are a really broad category of chemicals. They include insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, several different types of isides. Um, as humans, we can be exposed through a few different um, routes. So most of the population is chronically exposed through our diet. Um, we are also exposed through agricultural drift and residential and occupational use. Today, I'm gonna to be talking mostly about agricultural drift. Um, and pesticides also display toxicity for ecosystems, animals, and for humans. So pesticides have really complex, wide-ranging health effects. They depend, um, the targets depend on the class and the type, um, but these effects are often not apparent until several decades after registration. So glyphosate came into, for example, glyphosate um, was registered sometime in the 1950s, and it's being pulled from the market next year. So after 70 years of uh, chronic exposure and potentially causing lots of cancer, um, it's finally being pulled after a couple of decades of research. Regulation of pesticides is highly dependent on post-registration monitoring. And when I say post-registration monitoring, I mean studies by uh, research scientists like us. Um, and thousands of pesticides are currently registered for use. But the vast majority of these pesticides have little to no post-registration studies available on them. Um, and another issue with these studies is that the rate of research production on some of these specific insecticides are actually not related at all to the rate of use of these pesticides. So this is a um, chart that I generated from my data. On the x-axis, we have the number of children's health studies in PubMed. And on the y-axis, we have the use rank for these pesticides from 2011 through 2016. So at the top, you can see glyphosate. That's the most commonly used pesticide in Arizona during this time period. And then at the bottom is mandipropamide, which was the 25th most commonly used pesticide. So what you can see is that um, for the vast majority of these pesticides, um, between zero and 20 uh, publications exist for each of those pesticides. And the vast majority of the children's health studies are actually concentrated on four ingredients. So glyphosate, which is about to be pulled from the market, malathion, permethrin, and actually most of those studies are just on the, uh, the efficacy of permethrin for scabies in children, and then uh, chlorpyrifos, which was just banned. So when I was looking at this chart, I, so you can't help but notice that there's huge gaps in the number of studies for the vast majority of the most commonly used pesticides. And I wondered if maybe this is just because the most toxic pesticides um, are overstudied and the least toxic pesticides are understudied. Maybe we don't care about the ones that have all of the gaps because they're the least toxic. And, um, and this might be supported by the idea that of the four most commonly studied pesticides, two of them have been recently banned or pulled from the market. So that's sort of a side question, but we'll talk about it um, in a little bit. So um, one way, sorry, so one way that we can get at um, covering the gap on the, the non-existent literature is we can use what's called an untargeted approach to study them all simultaneously. So untargeted high throughput studies are often used in laboratory environments and they can generate hypotheses for novel health targets or for novel health exposures. And so I'm proposing to use them, um, but just with existing big data. So we could talk about them from the uh, perspective of untargeted outcomes or untargeted exposures. And today I'm gonna to be talking about untargeted exposures. So one of the reasons that most of the pesticides are understudied or unstudied is because exposure is really difficult to measure. So historically we use biomarkers to study um, pesticide exposure, but these are expensive. They are unavailable for the vast majority of pesticides, and they're also difficult to develop in the lab. So we can't use an untargeted approach using a biomarker-based um, using a biomarker-based approach um, because we simply can't know the extent of pesticides that somebody's exposed to. 
However, we can use pesticide registries, um, which record all the pesticide applications that have occurred in a given area, but those are largely unavailable across the world and across the United States, with the exception of California and the great state of Arizona. So Arizona has these really wonderful resources that make untargeted pesticide studies um, feasible in the state. So one resource is the statewide pesticide use registry, which goes back to 1992 and provides a record of every commercially available, or sorry, every commercial application of agricultural pesticides. And then we also have university and statewide support um, for health outcomes research. So we have access to data from Medicaid, birth certificates, cancer registries, birth defects registries, EMRs, and hospital admissions data. And this is really unique to the state of Arizona. Most universities in most states don't have these agreements in place. So we have to thank some of our administration and some of our, um, some of our historic VPs, I think, for getting us access to this info. I'm not gonna talk about that yet, but um, so I'm gonna show you guys a sneak peek of some of the potential for this data where I linked birth certificates um, with the pesticide use registry and performed an untargeted pesticide-wide association study. So the outcome I'm gonna talk about today, which is one of, one of several um, tens or hundreds of outcomes that could possibly be studied is extremely preterm birth. And I'm studying, I chose extremely preterm birth because it's a rare outcome, which are traditionally difficult to study in epi. And, um, but it has uh, significant and, and dramatic um, morbidity and mortality implications. So extremely preterm birth are births that occur before 28 weeks of gestation. Um, at 22 weeks, the vast majority of these babies pass away. At 28 weeks, we get down to 20% mortality, but that's still very significant mortality. And then many of these babies that survive go on to have lifelong complications and, um, or, and disabilities. So I performed a, comport a comparative analysis of pesticides during pregnancy and during preconception, which is actually before a woman is pregnant at all, um, with extremely preterm birth. I linked Arizona pesticide applications from 2006 through 2016. Um, I did only have a subset of pesticides available from 2006 through 2011, so I'm presenting the 2006 through 2011 data separately from the 2006 through 2016. Um, I calculated binary exposures. So if a woman lived within a certain distance of a pesticide application during preconception or during pregnancy, they were uh, considered exposed during that time period. Um, I restricted only to births in agricultural zones and performed logistic regressions of pesticides by trimester with extremely preterm birth. And I controlled for um, several important variables and performed FDR adjustment and looked at both specific pesticides and some of the major pesticide classes. So about 29% of the births from 2011 through 2016 lived within 2,000 meters of an agricultural, an actively used agricultural field. Um, in these areas, 891 births were extremely preterm, and um, almost 300 unique pesticide active ingredients were applied at least 250 times over this time period. And um, Yuma is in the bottom left corner of this image, and then we have uh, Maricopa County and Pinal County, and then in the um, top left is the Colorado River Indian tribe. Okay, so just some results fairly quickly. So these are the 2006 through 2016 results. Um, so here I'm just showing uh, pesticides that had at least one association that was significant at FDR less than 0.05. In that first column is the preconception window. It's labeled T0 just because it's preconception. T1 is first trimester and T2 is second trimester. Anything to the right of that dotted line means that the odds ratio um, is uh, above one, which means it was positively associated with preterm birth. Um, and then the buffers are colored so that the 100 meter is uh, at the bottom and the 2000 meter is at the top in purple. So what you can see here is that um, several of these OPs, pyrethroids and carbamates are associated with preterm birth at during preconception. Um, and then we see a few during the first trimester and one during the second trimester. Um, and so most of them were associated at multiple different buffers, so at multiple different distances from the application, and, um, but almost all of them were associated just during one uh, time window, which suggests that maybe there are some uh, sensitive time windows of exposure for pesticides. <clears throat> 
So these are the rest of the pesticides that we had from 2011 through 2016. And if you'll remember, we studied almost, uh, well, we studied over 200 pesticides. So these are just the ones that had a significant association in this study. Um, and there's a few things to note. Let's see if this works. Okay, so three of these pesticides were significantly associated at two, at least two different time periods. So both during preconception and during the first trimester. And then several of these pesticides were associated at multiple different buffers. And then another thing to note is that um, for the ones where all of the buffers are shown, so all buffers were significant, you can see a dose response relationship. So if you specifically look um, about uh, two thirds of the way down at potassium salt of aminocyclopyrifluor in the first trimester, um, the strongest association is for the 100 meter buffer. So if you live in the 100 meter buffer, you have the, the highest risk of an extremely preterm birth. And then the um, risk goes down as your buffer increases. So as you live farther away from the pesticide application, your risk goes down. So this is just a fairly compelling um, set of results. You also see that uh, that dose response for Raynutria sichelinensis, um, which is just a couple of pesticides down. So these are the top 25 most commonly used pesticides that I showed you guys at the beginning, and they are ordered actually by the number of children's health studies. So permethrin had the most children's health studies, carfentrazone, ethyl, flubendiamide, and imazimox at the bottom had, had no studies. Um, and you can see that the associations um, really are randomly distributed across the length of the, the x-axis. So, um, uh, so the association with uh, toxicity, really, we don't see that. We don't see that the more the, the, the overstudied pesticides have more toxicity. Um, and another thing to note is that for these very commonly used pesticides, the preconception period appears to be more important than first trimester or second trimester. Um, and this is just a plot showing the p-value of, of the pesticides in, in my study plotted against the number of children's health studies. And if the pesticides that were overstudied were the most toxic, you would see a relationship up here with low p-value in most studies. And then, um, and then another association down here with higher p-value um, and, and less studies, and we don't see that. We really see that it's randomly distributed. So of the top 25 most commonly used pesticides, nine or 36% of them were significantly associated with very preterm birth. Um, this approach did implicate both uh, pesticides that were commonly used and understudied. And we also saw associations for familiar pesticides that are regularly studied. Um, we see evidence for new windows of sensitivity. So preconception does appear important um, and no relationship between existing studies and strength of association in our study. Um, so this suggests that there is significant researcher bias when we're choosing which pesticides to study and that untargeted approaches might be valuable in overcoming that bias. Um, the PUR method also demonstrates significant cost savings. So to have done this study with biomarkers, um, it would have actually cost $1.5 billion for the analysis alone, <laughs> um, but that's obviously not possible, not just because of cost, but because the laboratory methods um, don't really exist and aren't suited for this type of analysis. Um, we were also able to study a rare birth outcome at less than 1% of births and rare exposures, um, with the caveat that the cell counts for some of these exposed cases tended to be small. Okay, we have time for questions. Melissa, that was a great talk. Thank you. Um, your, the analysis of just the number of studies on the, the pesticides presumes that they were all positive, but I'm sure that some of them were negative and some were positive. Have you, have you looked to see not just the number of, of studies that were done on each one, but, but whether or not they were positive versus negative that the findings were were positive or negative on on their on uh, to, to preterm birth yeah um so it wasn't actually about preterm birth it was just um i all i did was search uh enter the search term children's health and then the um the pesticide name after it and then counted the number of studies so um if I, i'm sure that if i were to look you know i'm sure there's publication bias obviously so i'm sure that a lot of null studies 
and um, you know, inverse associations wouldn't be published. And that I'm sure that most of these are positive, but also just a lot of them is just, there's just no studies, about half of them, there's just nothing at all. So there's just absolutely no data, positive or negative. Um, but certainly like for chlorpyrifos, most of those studies show a, um, a, a, an adverse effect. Thank, Thank you. you, Melissa. Appreciate it.